Great. Well, thank you, Henry. And uh, let's jump to this reading. And uh, I have the document here. I'm not going to be uh, screen sharing per se. This is kind of a performance in the uh, in the spirit of uh, John Dotson, um, who's who's gradually um, encouraged me to do this kind of thing uh, for some of our sessions. Okay, so I suppose I will spotlight myself so everybody can see. So um, the context behind this reading, mutations, imagination, and futurability. Uh, is that it is an opening introductory essay for a forthcoming journal anthology called Mutations. And uh, it took a long time to kind of get where I was going with this, as, as maybe you'll see. Um, but essentially, it kind of came down to this triptych of mutations, imagination, futurability as concepts that play and interplay with each other as sort of a useful way of thinking, um, obviously playful, I don't want to reify them too much, but a useful way of thinking about social transformation and cultural evolution. So I'm just going to be reading it and uh, then we can kind of open up and explore some of it and maybe even fold it back into uh, Henry's presentation and, and relate to tensions, differences, overlaps, intricacies uh, that might arise here between us. So here we go. Mutation zero, which is the name, the issue of the, the volume here, um, volume zero. Mutation zero enters time orthogonally. Lately, time has felt more like a broken rhythm. Clock time was already wavering, a thin trance waiting to be liberated from the speed of capital. In its place, time has become a strange pluralism. It rushes forward and stands still. Time is the heaviness we feel about uncertain climate futures and the weightless flurry of all our transient nows. Time shows up as the rote pulse of calendar app notifications, now robbed of any sense of urgency during the blurry weeks of COVID lockdown. But we all feel that a different order of time has come alive in its place. A torrent, dramatic and full, roaring with the import of historical, political, and planetary events. Mutations of language concerning this emergent consciousness of time have proliferated. With new temporal sensibilities come new senses of world, self, and being. And so there are the great lists of proclaimed epochs attempting to name the when and the where of our arrival. Anthropocene, Cthulhu scene, Capitalocene, really, quote, a history with a thousand names and the infinity of the Anthropocene. The present array of epoch naming speaks to a certain recognition, a new structure of feeling showing up in public conversations like the gloomy ambience of an Anthropocene track. We no longer ask, how is the weather without that track pervading the space between words? Time makes an appearance in those interstices too, a subtle recognition, a certain anxiousness, perhaps even a sense of guilt that although we are already living in a new time, demanding a new worldview, we do not know how to address this remarkable new realism. Stated poetically, because it is often through poetry and imagination where we first find language adequate enough to begin voicing this planetary intensification, we have begun to trace in the very bones of our being the contours of a new worldview. The theme of time stitches together every fiber of Anthropocene living. Whenever we circumambulate the loaded subject of climate and conversation, we intuitively grok French philosopher Paul Valéry's now well-worn aphorism, quote, the future is no longer quite what it used to be, unquote. That line has become something like a melancholic track stuck on repeat. When we name this slippery feeling, call it a climate melancholia, the naming reveals something about the entangled relations between time, capital, and climate, i.e. capitalocene, but it also discloses characteristics of the new time that has already begun to shape our social imaginaries. Franco Bifo Berardi, in his 2011 book, After the Future, called it the slow cancellation of the future, bringing attention to the underlying metaphysical and mythological assumptions our culture makes about the nature and direction of time itself. The moderns, or those who were, quote, pervaded by a religious belief in the future, a future often involving the unending development of capital, have ultimately lost faith in their utopias of tomorrow. 
Whereas the early 20th century could be characterized by Italian futurists like Filippo Tommaso Marinetti and his poetic glorification of the newly invented race car, quote, God of a race of steel, drunken on space. We, the inhabitants of the present, no longer imbue the future with an electro-utopian aura. The digital age has arrived, but it did not bring about the emancipation of labor. The cultural sensibility of the moderns, those who imagine that time was like a race car powering the brilliantine engine of capital, has receded in favor of a wilder realism. It is this wilder realism which enters time orthogonally. The structure of feeling pervading our culture already acknowledges the arrival of this new time. Quote, the music we grew up with, a distorted radio voice states on a recent Oneo Tricks Point Never track, quote, doesn't speak for us in the new era we're going, now th or going through now. Now, simply, we all grew up to be something new, unquote. If the very particular and very modern consciousness of time in the future has receded from the horizon of our being, it is because we already find ourselves in a mutational process of realizing new forms of being, both within and without. Planetary conditions have readily testified to this radical transparency. Quote, at any given moment, Andreas Malm wrote in The Progress of the Storm, Nature and Society in a Warming World, the excess of heat in the Earth's system is the sum of all those historical fires. The storm of climate change draws its force from countless acts of combustion. We can never be in the heat of the moment, only the heat of this ongoing past. Indeed, the air is heavy with time." Unquote. And uh, I, I had, a, as a little anecdote in, the, in that particular book, which I have a hard copy of, I scribbled a big exclamation mark there in the same way that Gepser sometimes will do this when um, uh, he, he's quoting somebody in the ever-present origin, and uh, they're, they're saying something that's just right on the money. It's exactly, you know, he, he's saying something about time and space and consciousness, and Gebser just has that little exclamation point and little, little parentheses. I did the same thing. Um, each planetary event, whether climatological or viral, arrives like an emissary from the future, offering lessons like crystalline fragments belonging to the whole of time. Climate uniquely intensifies this and catalyzes, intensifies and catalyzes this new consciousness in ways that neither Marinetti's race car nor the stuck in forward gear capitalist time ever could. When we approach the subject of climate through the singularity of events like heat domes or hurricanes, we encounter a radically transparent temporality where the present is always already, quote, dissolving into past and future alike. Another fragment from the future arrives with this insight. The past erupts in the fiery heat of the present, quite literally in cases like the recent wildfires of the Pacific Northwest in Australia. The future holds a spooky intimacy with us too, enmeshed as unborn generations latently are in the activities of our present. Anthropocene time marks the enunciation of weird, as in twisted time, uncanny time. It stretches, folds, and enfolds in marvelous entanglements as if it were all happening at once. And it is. Like entering the zone in Andrei Tarkovsky's, Tarkovsky's 1979 film, Stalker, weird time can never be approached directly. The shape of time takes on manifold forms, spirals, weaves, rhizomes, naming just a few, in order to accommodate these complex, processual, ever-intensifying ecological and climatological relationships. Weird time cannot be evaded. Transparency is found already in and through every step, every turn we make. Next section is called reversal. Eco-philosopher Tim, Timothy Morton made this point when he collaborated with artist Justin Bryce uh, Garalia to display eco haikus in public spaces. One reads, we are the asteroid. It is a provocative way of communicating Anthropocene weirdness. The uncomfortable realization that humans are responsible for the sixth great extinction. Another eco haiku goes, warning, human hurricane. And then the next goes for the explicitly temporal, for symbiosis, reduce speed now. When we linger, we create time. Relationships bloom. Unrelenting haste severs relationship. And like German philosopher Byung-Chul Han talks about, 
A culture driven so one-sidedly by haste creates the conditions for its own atomization. In the univocal embrace of haste, we lose space and time. We are no longer familiar enough with the pace of living relationship. The scent of time, like Proust's Madeline, can only be known by slowing down, growing into the fullness of time through our senses. Utopia has been yang, Ursula K. Le Guin wrote, comparing the culture of the moderns to the masculinity of the yang concept in Chinese philosophy. Quote, the big yang motorcycle trip, firm, active, aggressive, lineal, progressive, creative, expanding. Our civilization is now so intensely Yang that any imagination of bettering its injustices or eluding its self-destructiveness must involve a reversal, unquote. Slow down and reversal does not necessarily mean linear retrogrades, a mere gear shift, retreating back down the road we came. They are often a form of movement into new orders of being where our previous conceptions no longer make sense. Marshall McLuhan understood this too. The greatest of all reversals, he wrote in Understanding Media, took place with the new electronic culture, which, quote, ended sequence by making things instant. Orthogonal time breaks in. That great pattern of being McLuhan contemplated that reveals new and opposite forms just as the earlier forms reach their peak performance, from lineal connections to configurations, unquote. As the total colonization of time and the human being into algorithm is occurring, and even as remarkable innovations of financial capital continue unabated, a new order of being has already set in. This reversal, which is to say this emergent worldview, appears to involve, and here I have a list uh, of themes, a few, uh, hopefully not too many, A, the breaking free of time from clock time, and the constraints of capital in the old worldview. B, the resurgence and intensification of time through cl climatological and ecological realities, which in turn catalyze us in a new consciousness of time. C, the catastrophic collapse of our modernist worldview, creating a sense of mutational urgency and ne necessitating an orthogonal move into cultural practice al practices aligned with biospheric constraints, i.e. bioregionalism, peer-to-peer economics, and regenerative principles which decenter the human within a more cooperative, gaianthropic view. D, this orthogonal move involves the mutational leap from the abstract and extractive globalization to concretizing and regenerative planetization. That latter is from Tehard, that term planetization. While the latter two points exhibit our new reality and their existential gravity cannot be overstated, their realization in and through cultural evolution is prefigurative. Emissaries from the future continue to arrive in the form of catastrophe. They intensify and catalyze new mutations of thought and imagination. Our culture operates anachronistically in that even as we are shaped by the new structure of feeling, tomorrow's being, we continue to act from a knowing that belongs to yesterday. McLuhan, again, put it ever so succinctly. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. This is him. We march backwards into the future, unquote. Historian of consciousness, William Irwin Thompson recognized the initiatory potential that such disruptions can have on cultural transformation. Catastrophes, he wrote, are discontinuous transitions in culture nature through which knowing has an opening to being. Unquote. And so with any of these future fragments and orthogonal arrivals, we obtain momentary glimpses of tomorrow. These glimpses crystallize new pathways between our being and knowing, quote, a rapid flip over or reversal in which the unthinkable becomes possible, unquote. That's Thompson again. When our knowing and being are rendered transparent to one another, the future is present, even fulfilled to some immeasurable degree through our participation. When we move from the broad shape of cultural evolution and consider the life of an individual, orthogonal time shows up in the intensification of the spiritual present. The present aids us in foregoing the compulsive atomization of speed and the segmenting linearity of machine time, both of which only serve to divide ourselves in the world. It is through the spiritual present that we can act from a more intelligible and quote, senseful Gepser's word, senseful awareness that cultivates a friendlier consciousness of time and blossoms forth in us. Not a fragment, no, but the sudden flashing forth through the whole of time.
This form of intensified presence alone appears sufficiently luminous enough to render the integrality of our world with its living relationships in the radiant body of time at last cohered, visible, and transparent. End of section. And now, one of the last sections. Mutant Imaginations and Futurability, it's entitled. Another fragment from the ever-present future arrives through considering the symbiotic relationships that constitute our being. Complex intelligence we are learning shows up everywhere, from cephalopods to slime molds, other mycelial networks of fungi. We are a strange pluralism too, with bacteria making up more than half of our body's cells. Science fiction imaginaries are helping us to wrestle with this transparency. And as Arcady Martine so effectively queried in her recent fiction, how wide is the concept of you? Each of us then is, quote, already a symbi symbiotic being entangled with other symbiotic beings, unquote. That's a Tim Morton quote, a great book called uh, Being Ecological. For the old worldview, this entanglement feels like an almost unbearable transparency. But like the warming of climate and the intensification of time, it foments in us a potent mutational urgency. Kim Stanley Robinson has recently emphasized the catalytic and mutational import these realizations have on our culture. Quoting him now, to survive, you depend on any number of interspecies operations going on within you all at once. We are societies made of societies. There are nothing but societies. This is shocking news. It demands a whole new worldview, unquote. Fortunately, we find ourselves already standing or crawling, slithering, fluttering in a new time. The thick present anthropologist Donna Haraway named, quote, a temporality of thick, fibrous, and, and lumpy now, which is ancient and not, a tentacular web of troubling relations that matter now, unquote. Descriptions like these are not definitive or totalizing. They are inquisitive and open mutagenic and creative matrix matrixes that help us relate with the living world that is always relating with us. Berardi uses the term futurability, which holds a helpful framing for mutations as a creative and time emancipating project. Futurability refer, this is, um, this is Berardi now speaking, quoting, futurability refers to the multidimensionality of the future. In the present, a plurality of futures is inscribed, he writes emphasizing that futurability is really the embrace of that wider and wilder time, the time of, quote, becoming other through creative actualization of futures, quote, already inscribed in the present. Berardi echoes the words of Swiss poet and phenomenologist of consciousness, Jean Gepser. Our concern, Gepser remarked in 1949, is to render transparent everything latent behind and before the world, to render transparent our own origin, our entire human past, as well as the present, which already contains the future. We are shaped and determined not only by today and yesterday, but by tomorrow as well." Unquote. The word mutation is borrowed from Gepser. He wrote about the transformational leaps of time, art, and language across the history of consciousness. A special import for Gepser was the integral mutation, the emergence of a transparent and aperspectival world, which he considered already well underway in the 20th century. This new mutation succinctly involved a fundamental leap, and I have three points for this one. One, from space and abstract thinking to time, processual thinking, in parentheses, thinking with time, and senseful awareness. Two, overcoming the many reified dualisms, human, non-human, self, other, past, future, life, death, through. Three, a realization of the new ontological ground transparency, a consciousness of the whole, which in turn makes the two previous characteristics possible. Transparency has created the necessary preconditions for a remedial process to take place, or stated explicitly, the regeneration of the whole history of consciousness, all previous mutations, which must be rendered whole and co-effectual through the ineradicable present if we are to realize the future, the integral mutation. What utterance in language could sufficiently speak to this new consciousness of time, this weirding of time into entangled threads of living relations, past, present, and future? How do mutations of consciousness and culture help us to make that orthogonal move into habitable futures? It is this inquiry into new ontological possibilities 
ecological, processual, or imaginal in nature that many of the contributors to Mutations Journal are writing about. And I would say many of us here as well, just in terms of the Gepsarian conference and our convergence here together, I, this, is, this, is our, this is our great work. Continuing, our journal is humbly seeking to continue that fundamental inquiry of Gepsers, cultural philosophy, answering the call of a mutational urgency and attempting to creatively participate with features that have already arrived and continue to shape the present. Mutation seeks to give voice, shape, to form these fragments of latent but present futures, body them forth through new language, art, scholarship, and even planetary imaginaries. If we are to have any future ability, if we wish to reclaim the future and therefore emancipate time from its capture by colonization, capital, and labor, it must be through an orthogonal move into new and intensified forms of consciousness and imagination. It really is mutants or bust. Mutations then, the orthogonal move into new ontologies of space and time, co-mingling with a revivified spiritual imagination helping us to cohere new and habitable planetary futures. The title for this issue, Art, Consciousness, and the Anthropocene, is a variation of this transformational triptych. Imagination, art, the creative process of shaping new futures, remediating ancestral histories, realizing them through aesthetics, storytelling, and other cultural expressions. Mutations, consciousness, the history of consciousness and cultural evolution actively shapes us in the present. When we clarify these histories, even trace the origins of our modern worldview to its respective consciousness structure, we can ameliorate the sense of vertigo during this inter interregnum period, teasing the threads of the old worldview from the new. Three, futurability, the Anthropocene. When we participate in new possibilities of time and space, self and world, we necessarily engage with the creative imagination and give these new concepts and sorry, give these new possibilities their language, art, and concepts, i.e., their historical forms. Fragments of the future bloom in the present. The two previous themes fold into this third: futurability, the creative participation with and realization of habitable futures through the radiant transparency of the intensified present. Mutations, imagination, futurability. Our existential moment of cultural evolution and bifurcation would seem to initiate us into such a dramatic and mutational urgency. The consciousness of the whole, integral human being is being called for in this moment of planetary crisis. Not the exhausted and partial expression of the human as modern, which has already concluded, but the transparent human, who can engage the unthinkable present of the Anthropocene because they recognize it as a mirror and creative invitation into their own being and knowing. It is through that unthinkable present, like an emptiness that is in reality very alive and very full, that we are learning to, quote, become the silence that calls the future. Whatever the integral, whatever else the integral mutation might be, it is the hope of me, the editor, that in the following pages, we will be much, that much closer to finding out. At least, at the very least, it involves the realization, thunderclap sudden or slow blooming spring assured, that we are already entangled in that radiant body of time. And so our tomorrow is always shaped in mutuality, in the sympoiesis, the making with of the spiritual present, the world asks for our participation. And that's it. Uh, that's the that's the the essay there. Um, thanks for uh, letting me read that out to you. Um, in this context, I know that it, sometimes it, it doesn't land, sometimes it does, but there there it is. Um, and really, for me, the the the, the triptych of mutations, imagination, futurability that's what needed to click, and and then the essay really cohered, um, really kind of leaning into no, what am I really saying? Let's run with these concepts. And the image, that kind of medieval image of the triptych, right, uh, really kind of came to the forefront of my imagination as, as uh, I was working on this. So anyway, we'd love to hear some questions. Um, I think uh, we've got a little bit of time. So uh, feel free to raise your hand or jump in. And as I'm saying, like, we're time free from now on. <laughs> um, we can, there you go. You've, you've, uh, you've concretized the acronym. So, um, if, if other forms of time need to take you away, that's fine. But otherwise, um, would love to hear from all of you.
if anybody's got something to say <laughs> or, or another thought, um, digression would be fun. Um, Jeremy, do you mind if I, ask Oh yeah. Aaron. Yeah, sure. Love to. Um, I'm just curious about the idea of the future is this, you know, infinite possibility and, uh, you know, potentiality versus, uh, a different idea you get in, um, you know, of memory of the future, the future as being, you know, not something that is developing, but already is, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm, I'm thinking very much of um, Ted Chiang's book, which was the basis of the film Arrival, you know, and it's a sense that, you know, time is whole and with our mental rational consciousness, we, we kind of, see, you know, have this directionality of time, but, you know, and this, and we, which we project into the future, but the other idea, the other side of that coin is that the future already, it's not just a, it's not just a potentiality, it, it already is. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, I would love to, love to hear it. Yeah, I, I think I'm kind of, what's interesting is, is, is uh, Berardi is, is flirting, I think, with that possibility but I, I don't know if he quite goes there with his definition of futurability and yet right. he's also saying like it's 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 active in the present right there there is a kind of creative force that the human can engage with and then there's this kind of narrowing down of well can that be realized right and not just in a kind of virtual sense in an abstract sense but that it's alive and in relationship with us in the present mm. I think that's 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 where I think Berardi is on point and, and, and intersects with Gepser a little bit. Right. Now, the other part, right, the, the Ted Chang stories or even Gepser's articulation that it's like, it's this living reality, right, that we're in an active co-shaping relationship with, I think takes it much further than Berardi can. So I'm, I'm deliberately kind of pushing Berardi over the edge into, into, <laughs> into, into Gepser a bit, but for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, it's fascinating. I mean, I've been drawn into these concepts quite strongly this year, um, more so than, um, I don't know, they've always been there, but for some reason this year they've, they've imposed themselves and especially the, the a chronon and the idea of time freedom, you know, so, um, but yeah, I think, you know, there is a sense that when we're talking about a whole and we're talking about the future as, as not a potentiality, but as a, um, already existing thing there's a tendency to want to see that as a rigid thing but like you're saying is it is this flow and flexibility and and vivified uh you know animated uh thing you know yeah there's there's um another sci-fi writer who i uh really enjoyed recently i mentioned him kim stanley robinson he's got this little book from 2007 called galileo's dream i don't want to spoil too much but it's on the back of the the back blurb where essentially Galileo is is visited by future scientists who live on the the Galilean moons, and um, th they have this interesting metaphor for him as they're trying to explain what happened. They said time is like this delta, right, with many estuaries, and they said imagine that, but imagine it doesn't just flow that one way. It actually kind of it can flow in reverse, and there's main currents, there's main rivers, and then there's little estuaries, and there's whole sets of infinite fluxes and flows that kind of are all in this sort of dynamic interrelationship. And I thought, well, that's, that sounds very Gibsarian actually in that, yeah, in his attempt to describe time. So that's really nice. It almost reminds me of Borges as well. You know, time is a river and I am the river. And, um, and also that's really interesting of, of time as fluid, you know, as, as, as liquid water, like the ancient and the Greeks, had, I mean, some of the etymologies of, of words like aeon have a reference to like fluid concepts because, and for the Greeks, they used a, a instead of an hourglass, they had like a, a device that would just um, let water drain out of it. So they'd measure time by the, the, the flow of water in a, in, a, in, a, in a similar way that we might measure it by a flow of sand, you know? So kind of like that fluidity. Yeah, and, and like you're saying, you're pointing to that really important dimension of this uh, that that I think some science fiction and, and 
maybe more modernist shaped cultural narratives about time, even in science fiction, have this sort of linearity where the future is singular and it has already happened. And, and then there's this kind of retro causality or time loops, right? Where someone gets right. stuck and they can't change the time or if they change it, it's, it's, it is linearly changed, right? But this, this kind of, to actually allow for this principle of the a coronon or time freedom, it kind of necessitates that time paradoxically be, yes, shaping the present, like the future shapes the present. Yeah. But then it has to be able to kind of go the other way. There's, there's a kind of creative agency and, and openness and, and participation that Gebser talks about that needs to, to be there for it to kind of make sense. Um, and, and, and I don't know, this creatively open time and, and invite our participation. Yeah, there's very much, there needs to be um, the carrying out of what is pre-written in a way. And I think Chiang talks about that and in, in it compares it to like a script, you know, like it's, there's this, that the future is pre-written, but we still have to go and um, perform, you know, the performativity of that pre-written uh, script, which is, you know, quite, you know, it's, it's a quite an interesting concept. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, I, I have more thoughts, but I, I want to make sure we, yeah, yeah, we get can to around, but thank you, Aaron. Yeah. yeah no fantastic. Problem. Um, and by the way, everyone, uh, Aaron and, and I, and, and Rudolf Hammerley are going to be having a, a panel on, uh, next Saturday. Um, we're going to be talking about the Gepser Society project or the Gepser project and some of, uh, what Rudolf Hammerley has been working on with, uh, publishing Gepser and annotated collected works. So really looking forward to that, Aaron. Um, yeah. let me jump to, uh, Marie and then and then Barbara. I I just want to say thank you for being um, so good at putting things into words. I'm a <laughs> I'm a shamanic practitioner and an artist, so I can put things visually or see things energetically and work on that place. And it's a real gift to be able to articulate it. So it makes sense to people and they can relate clearly, which is what you do. So I just thank you and Henry and this whole group because you all do it wonderfully. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, I mean, um, speaking of, of, of like the new new words, new utterances, uh, um, I think, Aaron, you're going to be doing a reading of some of Gebser's poetry next week as well during the, the poetry reading, um, some translated works. And, and I think... Would love to. We'll go into that next week too, in terms of the art of translation for Gebser, but also, you know, this was important for Gebser too, in the sense that uh, we need a new utterance, right? We need a new statement. He described it as the new statement, and um, it's no, it's no surprise at all to me that Gebser was starting off as a as a poet, and he was a poet his whole life, because there's a kind of energy in there as I was talking about in my piece that it's it's the creativity of language that is very often that first hurdle in in concretizing and, and making visible what's invisible or, or um, moving felt sense and feeling into the articulation of uh, well creative self-expression but then also folding that into what the academics call our social imaginary. And I mentioned planetary imaginary in my, in the reading um, after Bruce Clark's book called Gaian Systems. And I just love that word. It's been, it's been ringing for me for a bit, this notion that, um, that the imagination folds the planetary into it. Right. But the way we do that is through the new, new language, new narratives, new working with time, new subjectivities that, that Algus was talking about. Like we are no longer, and maybe like Latour talks about, we're no longer modern, right? So if we're not the modern subject, what is this subjectivity that's folding into us? Is it cosmic? Is it planetary? But the language for it, I think is, is profoundly important. And um, this is what we're all, I think in one way or another working on in our group here, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Barbara, good to see you. Oh, you were uh, muted. Let me just ask to unmute. There we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, everybody. Hi, Aaron. 
It's good to see everybody here. I'm really enjoying it. I liked your essay a lot. And um, I've been thinking a lot, as you know, about somatics and how uh, we can render origin transparent in the body. And, you know, recently I've been thinking about this dualistically organized body really restricts what, how we can become and, and, and what we can become with. So I've been thinking a lot about fluids, Aaron, and this is <clears throat> you know, sort of just stating on a conversation you and I had about fluids and water in the body. So I've been studying the extracellular matrix and the extracellular matrix is the part of our body <clears throat> that is in touch with every, every physiological organ and tissue and cell in the body, including the microbiome, which means that everything is absolutely connected and transparent on a physiological level. However, we still are, uh, you know, we still have this dualistic, dualistically organized, compartmentalized understanding of body and we have a whole healthcare system, which is actually, you know, sort of invested in that and a health and an insurance company as well that, you know, is, is all about compartmentalization and specialization. So anyway, um, I really think that the fluids is uh, sort of an, an aspect of ourselves that we can flourish in the sense that um, it's not a fixed or static uh, outcome, it's generating all the time new life. And not only is it generating new life, the fluids, you know, in touch with the cell and the um, DNA molecule in the cell, but it's also um, having to decide when a cell is no longer viable and then, you know, uh, create new cells. So we have this life going on inside of us all the time and it's not defined. It, if, you know, it's actually not defined at all and we can actually uh, influence it quite a bit. As you know, I have a real big interest in uh, microbes and the microbiome and mushrooms and um, been sort of, you know, and movement as a way to flourish this, this fluid ground, this fluid matrix of, of who we actually are. And uh, that if we started to see our body that way and see that we actually had quite a bit of agency to, to flourish this fluids and to uh, because the fluids, are, it's not a normal water. It's, it's, it's sort of like a, it can congeal. So we're in these modern postures where we're compressed, our tissue is compressed. And so the fluid congeals and then the body responds in the way that the fluid is congealed. However, fluid movement, which is, you know, sort of the, the thing I've been really exploring and how this can sort of render origin transparent is that it actually renders all the different physiological constituents transparent to each other. So then what you, you, you actually have this, we have this capacity to self make with ourselves to, to sort of, uh, you know, create with our turning the, the, the self create, you talk about this, uh, Aaron, in your book, um, turning this, um, creativity back on ourselves and becoming with ourselves, becoming with the complement or the plenum, I like that word too, that you use, Jeremy, the plenum of sympoesis that we are. And then um, dovetailing that with the sympoesis that is uh, on the outside of us all the time. So when I start to actually think about all of that, it's, it's really you know, um, we haven't even scratched the surface of what our bodies are capable of. We're still really stuck in this dualistic model, which restricts what we can become. Yes, complete. I mean, that's, you, you're one of the contributors to, to mutation. So, so um, uh, folks will have a chance to, to dive in, uh, in your essay, Barbara, which is fantastic. But, um, 
Yeah, I, I think part of uh, what has been really interesting, just just sort of getting the 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 lay of the a perspectival land um, in recent year or two has been connecting with you and and seeing how much there's convergence with Gepser and your work and your work mm -hmm. with Aurobindo and integral yoga and this sort of uh, both of us are mutual inspiration and, and um, insight from Debashish Banerjee, right, and Aurobindo and the post-human turn. So that that th that's kind of the theme here, I think, which is um, that a perspectivity, integrality, and in this mutation corresponds and sort of shines through everything. Every our embodiment, our physicality, our materiality, our biology. And we can see that in the kind of array of scientific innovations that you're you're pointing to and you've, you've been teaching me about in terms of the microbiome and the fascia and the fluid of the body. Right. Even even the way we we sit around is a bit <laughs> mental rational, right? Um, so there, there is a kind of interesting rigidification that that is just the kind of ambient structure that that is reinforced constantly by our sitting in chairs and going to conferences, even fun dynamic conferences like this one. So so there's there's a whole world that I think opens up with embodiment and a perspectival embodiment. Or I've been playing around with that um, in your chat with uh, with Brandt, yeah. you and Brandt, the a perspectival body. And, and I just want to say that I think that there are sort of biophysical conversions and, and organs and parts of our body that were, you know, that are, are yet to be born. In fact, the interstitium, which is another fluid part of the body, part of the lymphatic system is a newly discovered organ, the glymphatics, which is the lymph, which again is water. So it's this theme of water, we're discovering this uh, tributaries of water in the body that are connecting brain and gut, uh, gut and nerve tissue and, and everything uh, connected through these tributaries of fluid and how important it is for that fluid to flow and that the fluid has a consciousness, remembers like the very first primitive cell remembers origin. It's almost like those fluids inside of us have a consciousness as well that remembers. And so we're still discovering parts about the body. And I think as uh, Sri Aurobindo said, there was capacities that we, we haven't even really fully um, realized or actualized yet that are, are waiting to be actualized. Yeah, there, there's um, something interesting here, linking some of what Aaron was speaking to about this, with the acron acronon, this, this need to really incorporate this creative freedom with time. Yeah. But then also, as you're saying, this sort of creative fluidity. open freedom, fluidity with the body and the co-shaping of human agency and consciousness with our own embodiment is a sort of exactly. dynamic, creative yeah. relationship. And then when you extend that into this sort of planetary context, this is something I think um, uh, Debashish talks about with Aurobindo in the context of post-humanism and Simon Don and Simon Don talking about this planetary trans individuated person that's able to have this sort of yeah. new plasticity. I mean, one of the things I got from the speaker this morning, Edge, is, is that, you know, uh, origin is originary. That means it's still individuating. So we don't even have all of what origin is. It's like the body. The body is originary. Every moment new life is being birthed in our microbiome, cells are dying, cells are being replaced, lymph is taking away, the debris, the waste products, nutrition is coming into the cells, new, new nucleic acids are being, yeah, so it's like, it's originary, it's not even based upon what was there before, it's, it could be based upon what I ate that morning, or what trauma I'm going through now, or what, you know, how I sat at a computer for 12 hours and didn't get up to move around my body. I mean, there's so many aspects of it that we have a particular agency in um, changing. And uh, I like the word collaborating with. Yeah, collaboration, um, co-creative or co-evil 
C O E V A L. Yeah, right. It responds. It responds to our mm. co-creation. It. So yeah, I I I love that. Uh, how do you say his name? Agis? 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 The, the speaker this oh, morning. Oh, Algis. 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 Yeah. yeah. He said origin was originary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And individuating, Algis. and it needs us to individuate with, even on a physiological level. Mm. Well, There's, um, I, I loved how El just was emphasizing uh with Don Quixote. Um yeah. that was I got a kick out of that, but also the the um he, he seemed to be really emphasizing, and this is something Gepser points out, right? In creativity, origin is present, right? So that the cre- creativity itself, when sufficiently intensified and we are in a sufficient participation with it, that transparency is obviously mm-hmm. there that participation is there and then and then the kind of co-agency of origin in the human being as an agent as an expression mm-hmm. of origin there's a reciprocity yeah. there um there's an involvement yeah. there and it, he's he point he pointed that out with like transparencies in these sort of elevated intensified imaginal moments where you see through the world and and bring the imagination into that seeing through as this kind of mediational creative originary presence um so I, I thought it was it was really nice the way he um so like easily weaved that all together in his um in his examples but yeah um and yeah thank you barbara <laughs> we could keep going this is what we do when we when we meet up um <laughs> it's just it just keeps yeah and, and this cohort here as i was saying in the in the chat like it's so good to see some familiar faces here um like uh i saw lisa before glenn um aaron of course uh barbara jesse um it's it's been nice to to be mingling again um if even if it's only on on zoom so but uh yeah let's um it, in 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 the interest of continuing and continuing to kind of go around if anyone else wants to jump in with um some thoughts or, or inquiries more than welcome um we can also conclude if that feels about right uh, again time freedom does not preclude conclusions um but uh rob was saying uh uh, yeah, I, I would love to publish it uh, soon. I'm I'm just kind of working on. I just finished an application to CIS, <laughs> um, and that essay as well this week. So I'm just kind of in a head swimming moment. But I, I hope to have that essay and the and the rest of that issue published um, end of November. I'm guessing realistically, um, very beginning of December, probably by the latest, and it'll be in that collection. Um, so yeah. I'll, I'll let you know, and we'll probably send a note out to any, all the registrants for the, the Gepser conference as interesting Gepserian media becomes available, and that will certainly be as part of the announcements. But um, yeah, let me go to Jamie and then, and then Danny. Okay. Well, uh, yes, thank you, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I, I love the language um, that this, um, and this very fresh, vibrant with, um, and um, so my question is, um, I'm particularly in, interested in the word entangled. And for me, to me, is there, you know, I, when I was a undergrad and studying quantum physics, you know, this, it was kind of a spiritual experience. It's a way of looking at, you know, kind of an, un, an unimaginable way of, 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 of reality. And so in, in this language, I used entangled several times. And is there, do you have any connotations about, instead of, uh, objects in space, prop, you know, we influence each other, propagating signals to each other. Entanglement's a completely different idea of where all possibilities exist until you measure, and then each of the connected parts are aligned. And is there, do you have any, I'm, I'm just kind of reaching out there, ooh, but is there any kind of that in your, in your writing here? Yeah, I, I, well, I think um, I like the technical meaning of entanglement. I think it's, it, it's, it's originated probably there through, through the, the science of it. And I think there's an interesting temporal dimension of that, which is it's not just extend, 
extended relationships through time, which I think are important, right? Like we were talking about, you're in a place, you observe relationship, everything is fluidly co-forming one another, co-informing one another. But then with entanglement, there's this other time-free dimension or, right? Like we're a thing here in simultaneity is a co is co-influential with a thing over here. Um, and I, 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 do I mention that in my, in my writings? I mean, to the, to the poetic degree that I think entanglement is is um, a loaded temporal term, right? That shows that everything is interrelated and maybe in the Buddhist sense of co, co co-forming, right? Codependent origination or something. Sure. Um, but I also kind of, I like it, in it because it highlights transparency as well. Um, Neri Oxman has a good essay called The Age of Entanglement, um, which is more about creative design work at MIT. But uh, part of that essay was really kind of pointing out this idea that everything's transparent with everything else, right? And, and, and almost in that kind of mutagenic sense, um, engineering might actually inspire a <laughs> paradigm in poetry, um, which might inspire a particular um, I, innovation in design that synthesizes both and that they're all entangled with one another simultaneously, right? So her that's her whole entire workspace, which I think she's a very kind of a perspectival in this sense, right? I think she's embodying a perspectivity through her design theory, which is everything's co interrelated with everything else. So when you poke here, you're also influencing something down here and they're, they're I don't know, vibrating, interacting with each other. So how do you have a theory of design that synergizes um, that interrelationship for the better, right? She thinks you can have a much more holistic and coherent design when you synergize it all. So I can't, I like entanglement in that sense, right? That everything is, you open up one thing and everything is, is simultaneously in some kind of present interrelationship with it. And whether we're talking about a particular field or study, or we're talking about the phenomenology of things arising in themselves, maybe they are entangled in that sense. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, that's my take. That's my attempt, <laughs> but great question, Jamie. Yeah. Um, hey, let me go to Danny and then maybe we can kind of just circle back and to see if we had any other questions as well for, for Henry or, or connections here. Um, and then maybe we can wrap it up. Hey, Henry. I stayed on. The reason I wasn't here to begin with is I stayed on and I'll just stayed on for an hour on the other line. So it was really good to, to really get into where he's coming from now. That seemed to be really apparent to me. And one of the ways, one of the where's or the house that he's coming from is the space in between. He's talking about, you know, the in between and, and, and trying to push people away from the things. Okay, so I think this fits in with what we're talking about. And so I wanted to kind of throw it back to you, Jeremy, with your essay. What's the in-betweenness? How, if I ask you just that question, what's the in-betweenness? What's the flavor of it? What's the, what's the mode of it? He talked about almost like that moonlight could be considered an in-between, that it affects things. It is not the things. So if I can throw that back to you. I mean, I don't know if I can articulate it better than than Algus. <laughs> no, just um, in terms of your essay, in terms of your essay, what your what your plan was. Well, I think seeing ourselves as as um, as beings that are extended through time, as, as like Algus was saying, there's you know, if you're waiting for someone, the the, the waiting for is already in the present present, right? That, that, that future person or thing that you're waiting for. So, so I think there's ways in which this new mutation of time that I think we have certainly intensified in the past few years um, is really emphasizing that, that continuity of, of being spread across time and their activity. And maybe that's another loose way to define entanglement too, but um, that we are 
in a co-present process with our recent ancestors and the fossil fuels they've burned at the same time that we are in a relation, an active living relationship with our un, the unborn future generations that are in the present. Um, and it is that relationship of what's in between, because what's in between is where Temporix can open up a kind of, like Al just, I think was saying, like that kind of visionary imaginal state where you can perceive the future or think of the future to begin with. And it happens in that transparency. Um, the, 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 the intensified presence of time, I think, is a, is a, a, a an unveiling of that transparency of that betweenness in such a way that it's it's. I think we've used this metaphor in in the past, but like you know, leaving your windows open on a drafty day, or somebody having done that, you su- there, there's a draft in the world, and the draft is is this opening of time, and and relationality and process and our own kind of uncanny co-presence across time. Um, I th- we're really wrestling with that, I think, right now. It's very uncomfortable. We want to run away from it or escape it or uh, pretend that things like the climate crisis aren't happening or, um, and it, not even in like the technical material sense, but the sort of ontological weirdness, the felt sense, right, that I was trying to point to in the essay, that that weirdness, that felt structure of feeling is that maybe, maybe that in between. That's some form of the transparency showing up, you know. Yeah, the ontological grounding. The one quality that I, as I'm listening to you, is that that in between is by nature in contact with everything, just like Barbara's fluid in between, right? You know, it's in the way that we don't, we, we keep separating things, but that in between, its very nature is that it is in contact, and yeah. and maybe teach can teach. Maybe we can teach. Yeah, and again, I think Algus was so good at just being present to that, and and really kind of maybe with his culmination of years of working with with. Yep, sir, and 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 thinking on these principles, just finding transparency everywhere, just the way he was able to illustrate it here and there, and this concept and this particular action, and I think that's good. That 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 is, I mean, if it is the ground, it's not just a new ground. Um, the new mutation. I think like Eric was kind of touching on this, like, okay, origin is present, okay, transparency, but what is this new mutation then? Like, is it just an awareness of that? Is it its own thing? What is its own thing like? You know, I think those are the interesting questions. Um, but what is its own thing like in terms of what are the qualities of this new mutation in themselves in the way that we can talk about the magic and the mythic, et cetera? Um, I, I think Gepser really kind of at least put his finger on some of those main beats, like the supersession of dualities. Um, but then they, the, those are all kind of prefigurative because then you have a human culture that is that has folded that awareness of transparency into a kind of creative historical realization. What does that look like, right? Well, to some degree, it's what's going on in the humanities right now with post-humanism and the non-human turn and object-oriented ontology and the kind of weird entanglement and transparency of objects, right? Um, So so I I see that happening. Um, The transparency that I was speaking about in my essay is that kind of um, the reality that Al just was pointing to about the Amazon as the lungs um, is really a kind of, like um, Sean Kelly calls it a, a concrete, uh, concrete universal for, for the sort of guy in turn. Mm-hmm. So, so I would say that's a form of transparency that it has an expression of it, right? A materialization of it in our cultural awareness and also as an historical event um, as we're kind of turning into towards the ecological. But I don't know. I, I would like to pick Eric's brain a little bit more about why he doesn't think the ecological is there. Um, but yeah, there's a couple more questions. Um, thank you, Danny. And again, um, there's no explicit limit here, but um, uh, let me let me jump to Veronica and then Betty. I think, if that's okay. 
Yeah, if Betty wants to go first, that's okay. Oh, Betty, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah. Just a short thing. Uh, to me, experimentally as a person, that um, space in between is sort of the time where we're in silence and like we're caught um, between two limitations. And in mm -hmm. the silence, we, we, it's broken. We, 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 we come into the something new. Now that's how you ex experimental way of, of living it, <laughs> but um, in a in a sense, it's hearing a voice that we've shut off. But in the silence, in that little gap of waiting, and letting loose of our what we're holding on to, it can come out. So I don't know how to put that in other language, but <laughs> um, it, it's sort of a way to experience it, or um, it happening in in our life. Mm, yeah, I thank you, Betty, for uh, articulating that very clearly. Um, I felt Al just did that, just like his ability to kind of wander into the poetic so clearly um, and easily. And I, I think I kind of felt that a little bit from you just now in, in your articulation. But um, yeah, I mean, Gebser also talks about that too, right? With the mythic, that mm -hmm. that turning in into, into silence, into the um, uh, relationship with the, the silent and the invisible, and then speaking it and sharing it as that kind of polar mm -hmm. movement that's complementary. Um, in that space between, I suppose, you know, maybe I'll just would say there's a transparency you find there too. Um, and, and I think Gebser talks about that as well, that, that, that any of the structures and any of the activities of the structures can be, you can find transparency and like the mythic can be hyper illuminated um, to, to, to presentiate origin. Um, perhaps the magical can as well. Um, and certainly the mental, yeah. what, where, where is it, where it is at its best, right. Um, sort of working with paradoxical thinking, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, let me jump to, and thank you, Betty. Let me jump to Veronica and then final go around. Just any, any last thoughts, um, about both of our presentations and, uh, then we'll be concluded. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, I'm sorry. I wasn't there, but. To me, the, the in-between, it's following on what uh, Betty was saying. The, I don't think that there wouldn't be anything without the in-between. <laughs> I think the in-between is uh, the pause between inhaling and exhaling. It's the gap between two thoughts. And I come to think now that origin is what we call um, creation. It, it's it's the pause between nothing rather than everything. And it, when you were speaking, for example, uh, Jeremy, you said we are, and then you paused and you continued. And the, it, it felt to me like the only reason why you could finish your sentence was because the past few words were bringing together the, the other words and it, and it merges and this is what's happening all the mm. time. I don't think there could be anything without in between the, the pause. Mm. And it, it causes the polarities. Inhaling is the heat, exhaling is the cold. So everything stays in balance because there is a pause in between. But it, it's experiential as well it's it's hard to articulate yeah yeah i mean well said <laughs> i have nothing more to add to that i feel like that's a very good, yeah. Yeah, it's good full articulation um but uh yeah any i think um marie did you have another thought i see your hand go up again so yeah marie and then final round 
I just wanted to thank Henry for um, talking about using his form in a group and having people be in the center and walk to different parts, which I just think is so great because you get to embody that. And I think you take over, I mean, that the energy will take you over of that place that you're in. So I, I love that you're doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so far, <clears throat> it really does seem to make a difference that that movement aspect, it really does help you get from one, one perspective to another uh, to do that, I find. It's amazing what people can do, like in family constellations, if you've ever done a family constellation, and they have you play roles of the family and different people in the group do. It's amazing what comes up free form. It's kind of that, um, yeah, just free form in the moment, which is great. So thank you. Thank you, Marie, and, and thank you, Henry. Uh, I, I suppose we could wrap it up here unless there's any other last questions or, or comments for for either, uh, either of us. Um, but maybe just a few notes about uh, this coming week. As I mentioned at the beginning, at the outset, uh, Saturday is our last day, the 23rd uh, of this year's conference. It's, it's kind of wild that we're already coming up on that and we're done with the second week. Um, but that should be quite good. And uh, we're going to be having Rudolf Hammerly and Aaron Cheek, who is here, and myself having a, a grand panel about translating Gepser, publishing Gepser, all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that, Aaron. Uh, we've also got Dave Zuckerman in the morning before us, um, in the hour before us, opening with uh, talking about the prison project. And then in the afternoon, we'll have some poetry reading. I think some poetry from uh, Aaron will be doing that reading of uh, some of Gepser's poetry. And uh, we're going to have some other readings as well. Um, someone reading from the prison that Dave was mentioning earlier, Michael. Um, so, yeah, just very honored to be able to be here for that and, and, and providing that opportunity. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to have some more cosmolocal activities. Um, we may only have one presentation we'll see for, for, uh, for St. Pete, but that'll be Sam Hines. And as far as I know, he's just described it as um, a, a presentation on transparency and communal reverie. Um, so we'll have more details in the next couple of days. And uh, the recordings of the proceedings from this weekend should be um, available in the next couple of days and we'll send them out once they are. But uh, otherwise, thank you everyone. Um, really love this. And thanks so much for coming to the Cosmo Local portion. So, all right, take care and uh, reach out if you've got any questions till, uh, till next weekend. Bye everybody.